Okay, welcome to our second installment of our Reform folks. We had Luther last week, and tonight we're looking at Ulrich, or sometimes they write Hudrich uh, Zwingli from Zurich, uh, but that's not where he was born, we'll get into that. But uh, he was the, what we would call the Zurich Reformer. Predates John Calvin, next week we'll have John Calvin, and then, uh, and then after that we'll look at some Anabaptist issues. Uh, Rightfully, we could put Anabaptists between them, but I'd rather go through the three big names first and, and, and have that, and especially since I'm having to do that presentation, it's, uh, it's good for me. So, this is uh, a map of Switzerland, and uh, it shows the various uh, city-states of, uh, of Switzerland. They call them cantons, uh, cantons, and, um, and Zurich then would be the ZH. Zurich here. And Zwingli is born here in St. Gallen. He's right next to the AI that's uh, part of Appenzell. You have their cheese tonight. That's how close he was. Um, and, then, uh, and then he uh, moves down to uh, Glarus, and then to Schwitz, and then finally to, to Zurich. Uh, and then he uh, negotiates with folks at Bern and folks at Geneva as well. Uh, to try to uh, to try to uh, persuade them to join the Protestant Reformation, but what we call the the forest cantons: Luzerne, Zug, Schwitz, Uri, and Niederwalden and Oldwalden. Uh, they uh, they hold out as Catholic regions. Uh, the William Tell story takes takes place in in this area here, where these where these uh, lakes are, and so uh, they hold out as uh, very conservative folks. So St. Gallen is where we start, and then it, with, uh, that's where he's born. When he's 10 years old, he, uh, his family sends him, well, already when he's eight years old, they send him to a little place near, uh, near his home called Vazen, because his uncle uh, is a, a learned man, and he uh, sends him to a school there. But at 10, he goes to Basel, and then, uh, and then at age 13, he goes to, uh, to Bern, and there he begins to study the classics. And when we talk about humanism, we're talking about return to the classics kind of idea um, that, um, that the theologians of the time read classic literature, uh, Aristotle and, and Plato and, and all these things, but also the uh, early, early church fathers, um, the uh, first and second century uh, uh, writers of the Christian era, as well as the New Testament. Then, um, then when he's 16, he, uh, he, he goes to Vienna, and there he uh, takes up not just classics, but also philosophy. And then finally he returns uh, for his university at, uh, at Basel, and when he finishes university, he becomes a classic teacher in the St. Martin Church there. And then, uh, and then from there, uh, in uh, 1506, in the, in the town of Constance on that, that dark blue space is the lake called Constance and where the Red Cross is, is the town itself. Uh, but the Bishop of Constance is the bishop over the St. Gallen region where he was born and the Zurich region as well. And so, uh, and so he ordains him as a priest in 1506. That same year, he's age 22. And that same year then he uh, uh, returns to his home uh, area of St. Gallen, where he was born in a little town called uh, Wildhaus. Um, uh, but his first sermon was in uh, Rockersville, and Rockersville is where Michael Muley is from, mm -hmm. uh, as in Emily and, and Michael. And uh, the, the blue area under it, <laughs> here, the blue area here, is, uh, is actually the tip of uh, Lake of Zurich. So we're dealing with uh, fairly close areas, although what you don't see here uh, is uh, here is a mountain reach, region there. Um, so while these places look very close, it might take you an hour to get from one village to the next with good roads today. When, um, uh, we'll mention it a bit later, but in uh, 1519 when he's in Zurich, he also gets bubonic plague. And he, he spends uh, well over a year uh, in healing from that. But uh, he goes to a place called Badregatz, 
uh, which is a, a, a thermal spa area, and uh, and that's where he uh, does his convalescence. From that's 15, 1506. That's the year that he's ordained. He also gets his first uh, he commission, and it's not in Saint Gallen, but it's in the canton of Glarus, and in fact, it's in the town of Glarus where he has his first parish, uh, and he's there for ten years, and. During that 10 years, he uh, uh, very intensely uh, studies Greek, a bit of Hebrew, um, and he gets uh, connected with the writings of Erasmus. Erasmus uh, translates uh, Latin Bible, makes a new translation. He's an expert in Greek, and he makes a, a new Latin translation. And, um, and he gets very involved with that. But also something happens. He, he begins to take issue with the whole notion that the, the Swiss cantons are um, are are earning money for their city treasuries by sending out soldiers uh, to uh, basically to the Austrians and to the French uh, who are fighting each other. Um, my professor liked to talk about a certain battle that went on in, in Zurich uh, where, um, where the Austrians were down at the bottom of the hill and the French were at the top of the hill and, um, and he says, but really it was the Swiss fighting for the Austrians at the bottom of the hill, and the Swiss fighting for the French at the top of the hill, fighting each other, but our hearts were at the top of the hill. The Habsburgs actually uh, started in Switzerland. Uh, Habich, uh, Hab, Hab, yeah, Habich, I-C-H-T, uh, is a word for hawk, and the legend goes that uh, in 1020, uh, the, uh, the fellow who who owned uh, this uh, this uh, land saw a hawk on his uh, on his uh, the wall of his little fortress, and so he named it Habsburg, and and that then uh, in in 1276 they uh, they moved the family holdings to Austria, and that's where you know it from um, from from the Austrian Empire, uh, the Habsburgs, and uh, and in 1415 the Swiss Confederacy. Uh, takes over uh, this area, and the Habsburgs are completely uh, eliminated from Switzerland. Uh, but Swiss mercenaries are still going uh, to help them, and uh, and also to help the French. Um, in fact, in fact, there was such a strong French uh, contingency in Glarus that uh, Zwingli basically got run out of his church. And uh, so, in 1516, he leaves Glarus, and he goes just slightly. Uh, closer to Zurich, uh, to Canton Schwitz, um, one of the uh, forest cantons, uh, but on the uh, on the side of the Lake of Zurich. Uh, you can't see uh, you can't see the, the Zurich Lake from where he was, but uh, but this is this is the Zurich Lake here. So it's bordering Canton Schwitz. Um, he went to a place called Einsiedeln uh, and became the people's priest there. And when, uh, and when he was there, he uh, again uh, um, be began, well, first off, what does it look like? That's the uh, St. Mindred Monastery there since the early 800s uh, that, that it's been there. Not that particular building, uh, but because uh, they burn every once in a while and have to be rebuilt and so on. But for over a thousand years, uh, the, there's been a, a monastery there. And, um, and this is not the monastery that Zwingli uh, uh, served in, um, and this is not what it looked like on the inside. While Zwingli was pushing the reformers to go ever more uh, plain in their decoration of their churches, uh, the Catholic Church was going ever more uh, ornate. So here you have Baroque and Rococo uh, interiors uh, there. Um, I said about where that guy is sitting here. Uh, at 7.30 in the morning, or the morning vespers when I, when I would go. Uh, it's a great place, very great place to be. And it has a kind of a rotunda, and the rotunda has uh, scenes leading upwards to heaven and with the sunlight in, in the middle uh, coming through. Yeah, it's very, very ornate. Is that the manger scene? Mary? It looks like there's Yeah, Mary, Mary, Mary and Joseph here, yeah with the little angels singing over here. And the shepherds here, you see? Yeah, you, you can stand there and just go around uh, look, looking at all of it. And if 
you don't fall over. It's, uh, it's very, very ornate. Well, that's where he was. And uh, um, he, he began doing what he called preaching the gospel. Now, preaching the gospel, uh, uh, I'll draw a little contrast later, but, but uh, his, his point was he was not preaching the traditions of the Catholic Church, but he was preaching from the New Testament. Okay. Basically that. <coughs> he he uh, denounced pilgrimages, uh, and particularly because pilgrimages to the uh, Einsiedeln Monastery uh, would, uh, would, would render you a little certificate, um, uh, and of course you make a donation, uh, that uh, some of your sins uh, have been uh, forgiven, and you won't have to spend as much time in purgatory uh, for that. And, um, and that, was, that was the big issue. I remember when we were talking about Luther last week, he wrote, he wrote the 95 uh, Theses, and basically that was against indulgences. Well, Swingley, Swingley took that up in context. He was at a place which was a place of Christian pilgrimage, and, um, and he saw the process happening right before his eyes and felt that this is not, this is not what the Bible teaches, and so he uh, protested against it, which didn't make him very popular with, uh, with the bishop there. But uh, in 1518, then, he, he, uh, he actually campaigned uh, to get the job at the uh, Grossmünster Church in, uh, in Zurich. And on the 1st of January, 1519, then he, uh, he went there as their pastor. So we started off in, in, St. G in St. Gallen up here. He came down to Glarus, then to Schwitz, and now he's coming up to Zurich. And remember, Zurich isn't that far from Constance, and it's part, and it's part of the diocese there, uh, so the Bishop of Constance is still his, uh, his authoritative figure. So in Zurich here, um, at the tip of the lake, the white part represents the lake, um, and those, uh, those places, Hartum and uh, Friesenberg, those are, those are actually tram stops in, in, in Zurich today because it's spread out so, so much. Um, and there he was the pastor at the Grossmünster uh, Church, the great uh, minster. Uh, you can see the mountains behind, not so far away. Uh, right on the other side, right on the other side of this mountain is Glorus. Um, and it takes you about 45 minutes to get there um, if you're driving in modern times. Um, it was a four lane highway. One right turn and keep keep, keep oh, moving. Yeah, his car. It, probably uh, two or three days. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and the church, of course, didn't look like that in his time. Uh, the, uh, the church was. Uh, had much more pointed spires than, than, than this, but they've changed over time. We're talking 500 years. So uh, things burn and change and so on. But he began there the January 1st, 1519. And if you recall Einsiedel, his last church, now I'm gonna show you the contrast. That's the, that's the uh, uh, center of the sanctuary. In, at the Grossmünster, it's, it's actually quite pretty, but very simple. And uh, they've, they've covered over frescoes. Um, sometimes they've whitewashed them uh, and, and, and damaged some of them, but uh, basically they covered them over so that uh, there has been, at least in the undercroft, some restoration work so that we can look and see what they, what they looked like. But his point was to, uh, was to get away from the ornate and, and go more simply. And looking the other way from the choir loft, um, the two, like Heinz Chapel, the two choir things on, on the sides there. Um. <coughs> it's actually quite pretty. But Zurich had a reputation beyond its wealth, even in Swingley's day. Uh, so uh, a couple of little Nice modern pictures here of him. Some uh, reveling going on in Zurich. Uh, some people call it the Swiss Corinth. <laughs> Think of the simplicity idea didn't follow. Yeah. <laughs> this would be like Mardi Gras, okay? That, that's, that's why you get these costumes. 
But uh, he began preaching whole books of the Bible. Now, I talked about him preaching the gospel, but he began preaching whole books of the Bible. Um, uh, Matthew first, and then Acts, and then the epistles of Paul. Uh, and he started with Romans. Um, and, uh, and he did that contrary to the selected texts of the Catholic Church. That would be what we call lectionary readings today. And his point was, he felt that the people, he felt that the people would learn more uh, about the continuity of the gospel uh, and get the whole story of Christ better fixed in their minds if he went straight through rather than picking and choosing this and that uh, lesson uh, from uh, week to week. And that became actually quite the pattern with Luther and it became also the pattern with Calvin. So, uh, and, and that's the pattern that I grew up with. I've only recently started using lectionary readings and, and the reason first time that I did it uh, was, um, was because it happened to be the beginning of the three year cycle, uh, the year that I thought about doing it. And so, and so I thought, well, let's do this one time through. But, uh, but what happened was some of our people in our, in our Baptist church who are from Catholic traditions, um, uh, uh, both appreciated that they could hear their friends talking about what was going on in their church that day and we had been talking about the same thing. And the second uh, was uh, uh, we were actually reading more scripture than we had been before when we just read a scripture a lesson uh, for the sermon. And they, 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 they felt like um, it was better worship for them if, uh, if we read more scripture. It wasn't a burden for me, and so, uh, so I simply did it. On the other hand, I'm, I've now done it so long that I'm kind of tired of it, and I'm ready to go back and do things for what is more natural for me. So we'll see uh, how this how this works out in, in, the, in a few months. Yes, uh, and lots of Baptists do, okay, and uh, Presbyterians do, and, and uh, uh, Methodists do. Uh, in fact, both the Presbyterians and the Le and the Methodists have posted on the internet their lectionary readings. Okay, now they correspond to common lectionary used in the Episcopalian Church, which varies a bit from the Roman Catholic, uh, basically, uh, because most of the time we don't use the, what we call the apocryphal Old Testament books, um, and sometimes they will have a reading in there. But they, whenever they do, they always give an option uh, for, for uh, another reading. So anyway, he, he used whole books of the Bible, and then, and then he, uh, and he worked with them in Greek, and, and Erasmus's Latin, uh, Latin translation, and he avoided uh, things that bothered him in, in Catholic preaching style, like uh, using allegory or stories from the lives of the saints in order to illustrate uh, themes and, and that sort of thing. Uh, when we look at uh, the 67 articles a bit later, uh, you'll see why that, uh, uh, why that lives of the saints would be something he didn't want to. Well, he fell ill. And, uh, and as I had told you earlier in the, in the evening that he recovered at that uh, health spa at uh, Bondergatz back in his home canton. And he returned actually more sober and intentional about the matters that he thought unbiblical. Uh, people described him as a polite humanist before, now he was intense. Okay. So that's polite. Red, less polite and, and, and ready to, uh, to uh, push things through and get some action. He preached against, for example, fasting. And by fasting, I'm, I'm talking mostly about the Lenten fast, uh, what he called the worship of saints, um, and, the, and, and what he also called the worship of icons, and, um, and also the celibacy of priests. Uh, it's holding that uh, priests ought to be allowed to get married. Um, and then he began a series of defenses, three in total, but uh, defenses to the city council uh, to, for his views. And, and it isn't that he went to the city council and petitioned them, uh, it's that he was called to account by the uh, Bishop of Constance, who would send a delegation down or somebody down uh, to, uh, uh, to complain. And of course, uh, people, uh, other priests in the area who happened to be uh, loyal to the, uh, uh, to the Catholic Church might be uh, spreading the word around that, uh, that he was uh, a heretic or, or that he was somehow preaching against the Pope or something like that. And in, in, those cases, in those cases, he had to defend himself. 
And so what he did then was to uh, call these public meetings uh, with the city council. And of course, the, uh, uh, when, when he did, uh, the content of what he was uh, offering to talk about, the bishop objected and sent delegates to represent them. Uh, but in, in fact, what happened was the council ruled with Sun Lee and his preaching. Um, and what's, what's beginning to happen is the development of what we would call a state church. Uh, rather, than, rather than the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church, the civil government is going to have authority over the affairs of the local churches. And that's, and that's what Swingley wanted. Uh, a couple of weeks from now, we'll say that's what the Anabaptists did not want. Okay. Um, but we won't talk much about them tonight. It's the, first, the first thing he did on this theme, on this theme of, uh, of Lenten fasting uh, was to write, uh, write a paper on the choice of free use of food, the choice and free use of foods. And basically what he says in it is, if you want to fast, do. But don't demand that other people do. And if you don't want to, then don't. Um, but don't make, it, don't make it a legal obligation that, uh, that everybody has to do. And when he says legal obligation, you see, you see it was enforced by the army or the, or the police. You, know? uh, you, could, you could be killed for not obeying the laws of the church. So, uh, so, so, um, so he felt that, uh, that people ought to have what he called uh, freedom to, um, and, he write, and he uses the word freedom a lot, and that's going to get carried over into the Anabaptists. A lot of the terms that he uses are going to get used against him okay, in the Anabaptist arguments against him. And, uh, and I, I, I toss them out freely with you guys because as many of you have uh, grown up in, well, two of you, maybe three of you, have grown up in Baptist churches, um, you, uh, you're, used to, you're used to hearing these words, and, 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 but they're not a Baptist invention. They were, they were kind of the democratic expressions of the day that Luther was using them sometimes, certainly Calvin, uh, different ones uh, using them. He also wrote uh, this thing called the Architelles, um, the, which uh, has been translated, the beginning and the end, where, uh, where he promoted freedom from the control of bishops. Uh, and he talked about how, how our interpretation of the, of the Bible is guided by the Holy Spirit, not by the tradition of the church. Um, and um, and now, now, Luther, now Luther is going to counter him on that in certain cases, um, and I'll get to that when we get to Marburg. But the guidance of the Holy Spirit, and then no need for church councils, because one of the things that the Bishop of Constance says to him is, these changes may come about that you're talking about, but they need to be decided by a council of all the churches. Otherwise, how are the people in Italy going to know that they even exist? Or the people in Austria, uh, you know, the, the other Catholic churches around the world, if it's something private to Zurich? You can't, you know, and, and even Bishop World here in Pittsburgh used that uh, statement with me once. Uh, he, said, he said, Gary, you can't, you can't make a change with one church. Uh, you can't, and he says you can't really make a change with one generation. You need a thousand years to make a good change. <laughs> so, so uh, and I told him, gosh, that sounds very wise, Bishop. I'm going to do it my way. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, and, and he went so far as to suggest, at least, uh, that, the, the pope, uh, that, that the Pope, in fact, does not have authority over the Word of God written in the Bible. He cannot, he cannot interpret it in a way other than the way the Bible says it. Now, does that mean the way Zwingli says the Bible says it is the right way? And, or the way the Pope says, I wasn't there. Uh, so, uh, so it gets used against him, all right? Luther even uses it against him, but, uh, but, uh, and Erasmus uses it against him, but, but, uh, but his basic point is the authority comes from the word of God. The authority does not come from the tradition of the church, nor the spokespeople of the church in any form of hierarchy up to and including the Pope. In uh, 1523, he sought to win uh, the uh, Bern, which is today's capital of Switzerland, 
uh, to this Protestant movement, and he invited uh, uh, all the priests of the area, some 300 uh, folks came to this uh, debate on uh, what we call the 67 articles, or 67 conclusions, or sometimes people say 67 theses, but uh, I have copies of them for you. They were posted on the internet, but I want us to take a look at, at some of them um, and just see how his uh, train of thought goes. He also has a, a large volume um, where he explains them in depth, um, but, uh, but just the statements themselves are enough for you to get the drift of, of what he's talking about. Um, but basically, they, they're divided into about 10 themes, and the themes are Christ is the only head of the church, that means the Pope is not the head of the church. Christ is the head of the church. Um, that the Word of God governs all, uh, as what's written in Scripture is the final authority for all faith and practice. Uh, that Christ is our righteousness. Remember last week when, when, uh, when Eric was talking about uh, the trade and I mentioned to you guys that his, the, the thing that Luther is talking about comes from 2 Corinthians 5.21, where it says, uh, uh, He became sin who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. That, that Christ, in the crucifixion, takes on our sin, in fact, becomes our sin, so that the, so that the wrath of God, which wipes out sin, wipes out Him. Okay? Uh, we then become the righteousness of God, uh, and in Luther's terms, uh, therefore uh, a gracious side of God um, because of the act of Christ and not, uh, and not the, the wrath that is directed toward God, uh, directed toward us because of right, God's righteous anger uh, against, the, uh, against the sinfulness of human beings. Um, he, he also, and, and this is where he and, and Luther got into it and never, and never got over it, that the uh, body and blood uh, of Christ are not present in a corporal way in the communion. In a spiritual way, you can talk about that. But in a, in a, in a corporeal way, uh, there is no transubstantiation. Okay? Uh, and now Luther said that too, but what Luther said is that, um, is that they are present with the bread and the wine, and that with statement uh, got labeled consubstantiation uh, because it was so close to the Catholic idea, uh, whereas uh, Zwingli uh, stuck to a more symbolic interpretation. Uh, even in John 6, where he talks about, um, maybe I should wait till Marburg to talk about that. And also that the uh, Mass as a sacrifice is an affront to Christ because Christ is the sacrifice not repeatable. You cannot stand up and repeat the sacrifice of Christ. That's an affront uh, to Christ that, uh, that he died once and for all. And for you to add anything to that or take anything away from that is an affront. It, it is self-sufficient. You know, The sufficiency of God's grace is there in that act of Christ's crucifixion. And for, and for us to remember it and to worship God because of it and to express our thanksgiving for it. All these are important, but to say that we are doing it somehow um, is, uh, is an affront. And, there, uh, and there's no need to pray uh, to mediators, uh, specifically pray to saints uh, on behalf of somebody. Um, and that, uh, and that, the, uh, uh, that the idea of purgatory is not scriptural. Uh, and uh, one of the Catholic <coughs> arguments against him was that, but purgatory is self-evident. Even if you can't find it in Scripture, it is so logical. Because, because everybody has sins that they have not confessed. And sins that you have not confessed have to be dealt with some way. And so after death, the sins that you have not confessed get dealt with uh, in, in, in purgatory. Um, and also the idea that uh, that uh, uh, you um, you die, but we read that the resurrection is coming with the, with the uh, second coming of Christ. So something must be happening in between. So it's logical that we have some in between station, and this in between station then uh, is is meant by uh, well, Swingley didn't buy that argument. 
uh, he simply stuck to the uh, he simply stuck to the notion that it's not in the Bible. It cannot be added to the Bible by us. Then um, also the adoring of icons. Notice he says adoring. He always he, he never says icons are bad uh, or that pictures are bad, images are bad, statues are bad. He never says that. But he talks about the worship of them, the adoring of them, uh, that kind of thing. That's what's bad. Um, and he answers those who, who say to him, but for the unlearned, it's, it is the scripture. Since they can't read, they can look at the picture and they can remember the story and, and experience the story, that kind of thing. And his response his responses will teach them to read. <laughs> it's modern times. Mm -hmm. Enough of this. Uh, and so, and so, in 1525, he uh, he he puts together a uh, a school for theological training that becomes that becomes ultimately the University of Zurich. Uh, and uh, I think I may have said to you before. Uh, if you pick up the catalog for the University of Zurich, it's not, it's not arranged alphabetically. Uh, it's arranged according to which was the first faculty, which was the second faculty, which was the third. So it was always fortunate for me because my list was always at the front and I didn't have to search very hard to, <laughs> to find my courses. <laughs> but um, anyway, uh, adoring of icons. And then marriage ought to be lawful for clergy. In, in 1524, actually, Zwingli got married to a woman he had been living with for two years. Uh, mm -hmm. There were very good friends of his who were priests who suggested that he ought to wait until some answer has been given before he starts living with this woman. Mm -hmm. uh, but he lived with her for two years. She was a widow uh, who had, um, who had uh, three children already. And with him, uh, she had four more. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so she was uh, a noble woman, <laughs> I would say. And, and that the wanton actions of the clergy were shameful. This is interesting because he was living with this woman, and yet he spoke of the wanton actions of the clergy. But by that, what he meant was they were allowed, not officially, but, but it happened that the bishop would sort of whisper and not dis, uh, denounce them uh, if, uh, if they gave a little money. Uh, and so, uh, and so uh, these uh, sort of clandestine relationships were going on among the clergy. Uh, Swingley, as Luther held out, that it's unnatural uh, to expect this of, uh, the, of the men for whom, together. sorry? The two go together, if you allow them to marry, then maybe there won't be as much. That was his point, yeah. that was his point, yeah. If we do that, we can probably wipe this out faster than just, uh, um, well, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's certainly a more honorable way than, <clears throat> than taking bribes. Well, these are basically the categories of the 67 articles, but he did win over Baron. Um, and, but, but what happened also is that because it involved the civil authorities, uh, it, it began a process that, that, that really developed into the modern day uh, representative democracy that, that Switzerland has and sets the foundation for what Calvin will later do uh, with the uh, Presbyterian Church. Uh, well, he doesn't call it the Presbyterian Church, but, um, but the, uh, the churches that he um, influenced. Plus the, uh, the churches to be administered by state authorities. Again, uh, the civil magistrates have authority over the affairs of the church, it's especially, especially in terms of, of the practices of the church. They didn't define the theological things like providence and, and uh, uh, original sin and all these kinds of things. He didn't leave that to the magistrates, but, but in terms of do we have to fast at Lent or not? Do we baptize children or not? Um, the practices were, uh, were uh, in the hands of the authorities and the order of the church or the orderliness of the church and the community then was uh, a responsibility of the uh, state authorities. In 1524, then, a new uh, debate uh, was held. Uh, Vatian comes down uh, from St. Gallen as the representative of the, uh, of the bishop 
and, uh, and presides over it. Uh, but the results, uh, because the civil magistrates were making the final decision, images were deemed non-scriptural as Swingley had held out and the mass was declared to be no sacrifice. We are not sacrificing Christ uh, in, in the conduct of the mass. We are remembering the sacrifice of Christ. We're celebrating the sacrifice of Christ, but we are not sacrificing Christ. Well, the, from the forest cantons, uh, Lucerne, uh, uh, a diet uh, from Lucerne sent a protest with the city council of Zurich uh, would not allow interference with them. And what happened was uh, it occurred to Swingley and some of the leaders they better get ready because this, this is going to lead to a fight, which in fact it did. Preparations for an eventual war between the Protestants and the Catholics began. Um, then uh, uh, all was not over yet. It didn't come until 1531. But, uh, but in 1525, he writes a commentary on true and false. There's a better spelling of false uh, religions. Uh, which deals with justification by faith alone. Uh, of course, Luther was talking about that too, right? Um, and the Lord's Supper especially, but in his discussion with the Lord's Supper, it caught Luther's attention. And um, in uh, 1529 at Marburg, uh, the two met and debated about uh, Luther's position, the real presence of Christ with the bread and wine, the notion of consubstantiation, while Swingley holds for a more symbolic understanding of the, of the words, this is my body. Now, here's the way Luther argues. Both men are talking about the strong words of Scripture. Both men are saying you can't add to or detract from what Scripture says. Both men are saying the word of God is given to us in Scripture. Okay? It's the coming of God to us in the incarnation of Christ, but... Uh, pronounced uh, to us in the in the written word. Luther has this uh, this notion of word and sacrament hold together. Okay. Now, Swingley is not big on the idea of sacrament, but but Luther is is much more Catholic in this in this uh, idea that word and sacrament hang together. So, what makes the sacrament a sacrament is not the action of the priest not the words that the priest speaks, uh, nor the activity of the, uh, of the humans involved. For example, in baptism, I get baptized, nothing about my action, therefore the Anabaptist can't be right. It can't be, it can't be dependent on a confession of faith. So, because that would, that would make your action somehow create the sacrament. And you can't, only Christ can create the sacrament. Uh, so, so it's impossible for your confession of faith uh, to be. To, well, but we don't call it a sacrament, right? Uh, so, uh, so, so this, this, but the word of Christ is what makes it a sacrament. And because you cannot add to or take from what Christ has said, if Christ says this is my body, then it is true, because. The word of God has made it true. And your protests can't make it untrue. He's talking to Swingley. Now, your protests can't make it untrue, or you can't make it more true uh, than, than Christ has already made it himself. You, know, you can't add to it, and you can't detract from it. Christ has said it, and therefore it is. All right? That's his argument. Swingley's counter-argument is, Christ also said, I am the vine, you are the branches. All of us understand that symbolically. None of us treat that as sacramental, that, that suddenly Christ has somehow become the branch, and we have somehow become, or the vine, and we have somehow become the branches. All of us understand that symbolically. In the same way, Swingley then goes back to, uh, to uh, Luther with this argument. Uh, when, when Christ says this about the bread and the wine, uh, he is, is talking uh, symbolically. Then Swingley gets himself in trouble because he goes on with John chapter 6, and he talks about the eating of the flesh. 
Jesus says, unless you eat my flesh, all right? Now, a few seconds later, Jesus says, I'm, I'm talking spiritually, but, but he says that, and Zwingli doesn't grab for the verse that Jesus uses, I'm speaking spiritually. Instead, Zwingli comes up with this wonderful interpretation that the eating of the bread is believing the action of eating is actually the action of believing. And so, and so Jesus is not saying, eat my flesh. He's saying, believe in me, because in 644 or 647, he says, no one comes to me unless the Father draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. I think it's 644 is one of Swingley's favorite verses. Uh, so, so it means, so that when we eat, it's, it, is, it is God drawing us to Christ that brings us to the table. And when we are there, our believing expresses itself in the act of eating. But it's, it's, really, it's really our believing that Jesus is focusing on. Now Luther comes back to Swingley and says, there you have it. He's adding to what the scripture says. That... The scripture does not say anything about eating my flesh is believing in me. You've now added to or tried to do a little bit better than Jesus did to explain himself. When Jesus very easily said down here, I'm speaking spiritually, and Luther held out that when he's talking about the consubstantiation notion, he's speaking spiritually. Okay. So, so Swingley gets himself tied in a knot, and his German isn't as good as Luther's either. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, you should see the number of Germans who read Swingley and describe him as speaking a semi-barbaric language. But, um, but because he, you know, he doesn't sound educated, he can't, he can't pronounce German without this crazy Swiss accent, and, um, and, and, he, uh, and he gets himself a little tongue-tied here, and, and Luther He's then open to Luther saying uh, he's added to what Jesus has said. So, uh, so the two depart, and they depart basically as enemies. Um, the, the Swiss reform and the Lutheran uh, reform uh, never come back together. Now, Calvin will go in the direction of Swingley, um, but uh, more than Luther. But, uh, but the Lutheran and, and the Bavarian the churches of southern Germany will tend to be a little more uh, uh, positive towards Finley, and but uh, uh, ultimately uh, side uh, with uh, the Catholic Church. Um, and so, so it, does, it isn't a, a really strong movement there. Well, that Marburg debate becomes the, the, uh, the, the thing that doesn't, uh, doesn't heal between Luther and Zwingli. Um, the the forest cantons of, uh, of, of uh, Luzern and Zug and Schwitz and uh, Niederwald and Uri uh, are all staunch Catholic cantons. They will not join this uh, reform movement. Uh, instead, uh, what happens is uh, the two uh, solidly reformed cantons, uh, Zurich and uh, Zurich here and Bern here, um, they, uh, they raise an army to defend themselves uh, because some 5,000 um, uh, soldiers from the, um, from the Catholic cantons come marching against uh, the Protestants at Zurich. They're able to get about 1,500 soldiers together by the time that they get there, but it turns out to be uh, a massacre. And uh, Zwingli is killed, he's beheaded, his arms and legs are cut off. They, burn his body with dung uh, so that nobody will use it like a relic in their church. Yeah. Uh, and, and, um, and that becomes the end of Ulrich Swingley. It doesn't become the end of his ideas. Uh, a, the Helvetic uh, Confession comes in 1536, sort of like the Concord that, uh, that Eric was talking about uh, from the Augsburg Confession and the, um, and the uh, various uh, um, uh, statements that had come out of Luther um, are, are after his time uh, put together. And the same thing happened a bit with, with Swingley in 1536. Calvin was also writing his institutes 
in 1536. So he's, uh, he's ties into this. But interestingly enough, you, you may have, uh, some of you are old enough to remember Michael rode the boat ashore, hallelujah, Michael rode the boat ashore, hallelujah. Uh, um, one line goes, the river Jordan is chilly and cold, hallelujah. It, it says chill, but if you pronounce it with a Swiss accent, kills the body, but not the soul. Um, um, this, this in 1531 uh, was, uh, was carved into the stone uh, that was placed to mark, uh, to mark the place where Zwingli died in battle. Uh, so it, it isn't from the 1960s, it's a little bit earlier. Uh, this expression, they may kill the body, but not the soul. So that's our, that's our map. I have a couple of things here I'd like for us to look to get, uh, to, together. Um, and uh, one, I'd like for each of you to have a copy of the uh, 67 articles here. I posted that on the internet, but uh, it's not mine. It says this is English translation is my own, but it's not. It's the guy who posted it on on the internet, and he puts the Latin and then he translates it. Uh, yeah. Question: When Swing uh, begins arguing about coming to Jesus being eating, mm -hmm. did he? It seems like it's verse thirty-five, which says, um, first of all, um, I'll start with verse thirty-three. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to it. Right. And they say, but say, for sir, from now and give us the bread. 35. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes, who comes to, me to me will never go hungry. And, and who, who believes, believes in me will never be thirsty. Yeah. So wasn't seemingly using that when he was, and then, I mean, Paul. Yeah, it, it is. He goes, he goes, he go, he does use that. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, but, but, um, but Luther, Luther's point is that the act, he, he says it there, he who comes to me and he who believes in me will never thirst. But he doesn't say the act of eating my body and drinking my blood is believing. He doesn't say that. So Luther took every line? All, both of them are trying to take everything literally. And, and, when, and when Swingley you know, has the argument of symbolism, but then he gets into... Uh, a symbolic argument himself, mm -hmm. rather than a literal argument, Luther uh, catches him on it. And, and, how, do, mm -hmm. and how do these two reformers, um, I guess they can never reconcile, but... Luther ultimately, Luther ultimately um, ranks Zwingli with the radical reformers, the Anabaptists, and those folks. Um, and in fact, it was shortly after 1531 when the Rev got in. Or Munster got in. Oh, 1535. But once Luther denies the authority of the Roman Catholic Church mm -hmm. to, uh, to say that this is the right interpretation and this is not, and he sets himself up as the standard by which is the right interpretation. And I was going to say, then he sets himself up for the same argument. Back from uh, Zwingli, and then basically, I guess I'm saying everyone who takes a position sets themselves up for a counter argument with someone else because you can just. And that's why the Anabaptists say. And then someone can go. But that's why the Anabaptists came not. We can read the scripture. We don't know. And then every single thing, we don't have a fraction. Once, like, I think you were the one who said this. Once you split from the Roman Catholic Church, then you just get infinite splits because. You yeah. split every single Once you've said there is no ultimate hierarchical right. authority, then, you just then you every, you everybody who has their, their own little fingers, fingers, fingers becomes their own. Luther and Zwingli agreed on that, though. Hmm? Yeah. Both of them said oh, yeah. there's no single authority. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Luther was lucky in terms of the, the civil government where he was. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that. Well, see, he had princes on his oh, side. Oh, in Germany, right? Yeah. Were yeah. yeah. The same way with the civil uh, government in Zurich, uh, it actually meant more power to them. They they weren't offended by the idea of being given more power. There's the rise of nationalism going on, and that's 
that's beginning to, you know, to, you know, to you know they, they were both Catholic priests. Mm -hmm. And what I think the story forgets all the time is that until Erasmus and Luther and some of these others translated the Bible, that this whole argument would not have arisen in the same format. I mean, when at the time just previous to this, there was no uh, translation of scripture in anybody's native tongue. It was in the Latin, and I guess it was in the Greek, but no one was speaking Greek in that part of the world. And so, if you looked at it, it's their first experiment with reading the scripture. Yeah, Huss and, and trying uh, to describe have been uh, killed for trying to translate the Bible into the vernacular. But um, well, yeah, that was one. That was one of the. That was one of the things that was uh, said uh, to Luther uh, about about his translating. He says, "See what happens." Uh, I can't remember who said it to him, but it was one of the Catholic uh, leaders who said to him. Uh, what maybe was it? Uh, see what happens when you put the hand, the Bible, in the hands of everybody. <laughs> well, when, and then of course the uh, well, like uh, like Swingley saying, "We'll teach them to read." Yeah. Um, Dave has been trying to say he keeps raising his hand. Uh, well, I actually read through all of these, mm -hmm. and I found several very interesting. Okay. And in particular, these interesting ones are not quoted again in the last uh, reference, while the standard ones are. And that would be, and really, you got to read 9 in order to appreciate 10, but if you just skip to 10 and just read 10 aloud, please. Four member. Not in Latin. <laughs> Go ahead, read it to us, uh, Okay, as, as a man is demented when members of his body operate without the head, tearing or wounding himself, so are the members of Christ insane without Christ their head. When they try to do something, they beat and wound themselves with ignorant laws. Mm -hmm. Now, see? how plain can you get? See, Catholics would say, so, see, one, that's one. why you need the vicar of Christ. But Swingley answers that in his long in his long explanation of what he's saying by saying, that, and that's what happened in the Catholic Church. No, they no, lost no, the vision that no. Christ is the head, and they come up with all these insane notions. Uh, aren't aren't, aren't <laughs> these his words? Yeah, I mean, are translated, but his yeah. words. Okay, uh, so it just seemed like that was really a, a worthwhile thing to understand about him trying to clarify the reality of what had become of the church. I mean, really, that's the, the issue. All of it is about what has become the reality of the church. Okay, and then I think it was 24. I can find 24 because I can't count that high in Roman numerals. Uh, 24. No Christian is required. Christ did not command. He is allowed to eat all food at any time. It follows, therefore, that pontifical writings concerning cheese and butter are a Roman <laughs> sham. Where, where now, let me let me understand the about the tonight. cheese, the Swiss well cheese, cheese and the butter. And what did Rome have to say about I, cheese and butter? I don't know. What fault? I, I was I, I was never aware of any fault with cheese and butter. Yeah, I don't know. I, I haven't I haven't read the long explanation. On that one. Maybe that's something to do with fasting. It's that, you know, the cholesterol is a problem? Low cholesterol diet in Rome. <laughs> as, as Romans are wont to do. Well, I mean, but there, there's several. I didn't, re I don't recall all of the ones, but the, these, these things that bring up questions as to what was the specific problem then. But his way of, of, you know, it's rather, it's a whole lot like losers in that he's really trying to fire them up. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's not saying things politely like Luther did. Luther, Luther oh, went on at- Luther never spoke politely. No, oh, well, no, but his, he, he used such, grandiose, gracious terminology to describe the person that he was about to stab in the back. 
but <laughs> this guy just comes right out with it. Boom. <laughs> Problems with all the reformers was they were they were they were, they were trying to reform the Roman Church, mm -hmm. and they and the Roman Church was resisting that reformation. But they themselves wanted to be completely doctrinal. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you didn't believe as Luther did, he often told you to go to hell in those terms. I mean, his, when he dealt with Erasmus, Erasmus had translated the Latin uh, uh, Bible into uh, the vernacular, and, and he did it from the Latin and the Greek, and he found, and the scholars supported him. This was before there was any thought of the Roman church being the only church. And there he found errors. And, and even Roman scholars agreed about those errors. They weren't big errors, but he found certain words that were in error. So when, the, when, uh, when Luther spoke out, Erasmus quickly tried to befriend Luther because Erasmus's effort was to go back and look at original documents. He thought it was edifying if you looked at the Greek and the Latin and started from there because the Latin over 1500 years, because this was in the 1500s, maybe, had become corrupted in the provinces. And that, that's understandable. I mean, the English gets corrupted as it comes from England to America, and some of the words don't mean the same thing. And they got along well until a couple of these disputes, and then Luther got into a terrific dispute with Erasmus. So that almost all the reformers felt what they had discovered was the right position and everyone else was wrong. I mean, there was no, there, there was not a, any sense of, well, maybe we can think about this for a while and, and still be friends. But I mean, when, you, when they came to a disagreement, as this dispute between Zwingli and Luther came, then they became enemies. I mean, they published pamphlets about each other. And the Germans were very good at publishing pamphlets because I think they invented the printing press and wood blocks. <laughs> well, they did. The wood blocks would be our version of cartoons. Now, we think of those wood blocks because a lot of them are pieces of art, you know, with saintly figures on them. But some of them would embarrass you if you saw them now. I mean, you, if you read some of them, and in that 15 or 20 year period, the printing of those pamphlets in Germany and in Switzerland mm -hmm. went from like about 10,000 a year for the whole world to up to like 50 or 60,000. There was a just tremendous outpouring of printing pamphlets. And that's how they disputed with each other, so that it, 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 like common sense. Yeah, it, it strikes me. It always it strikes me when I read the history. They didn't find any uh, ameliorating relationships if you didn't completely agree with them. But that printing but, press but, is another thing that's going on that would assist Swingley in uh, his theory of we'll teach them to read. It is not very right. Uh, back to your original question here. Uh, the translation here uh, from my professor is a little different from here. Um, every, Christ, every Christian is free to eat of any of the works which God did not... Is, any Christian is free of any of the works which God did not command and is allowed at all times to eat everything. From this we learn that the dispensations concerning cheese and butter are a Roman fraud. So when it says Roman, it means the Roman Catholic Church, right? Yeah. Um, and, and he goes on to say, he goes on to say that, uh, that the Roman Church evidently has, has uh, certain times when people are not supposed to eat bread and butter. 
but for a price, they'll give you a dispensation. <laughs> sort of like Paul. Oh. Every yeah. car manufacturer yeah. has to have yeah. this yeah. standard, yeah. but if you pay yeah. a price, you, you have a large yeah. time. Don't, don't close the book. Uh, we move on to 25. I don't, I don't completely understand it, but it's the same sort of a question, really. Yeah. Time and place are in the power of man. No man is in their power. Therefore, they who hinder time and place to fraud and rob Christians of their pious freedom. Well, 1535 wasn't that the uh, switch from the calendars? What, the Gregorian calendar? Right. I don't know. I don't know. Well, he's talking about time and place, yeah. uh, which today we would refer to as time and space, but it's the same thing. Um, and it, that they are in the power of man. No man is in their power. That is, you can decide where you want to go and when you want to go there. Hmm. Uh, therefore, they, they who hinder time and place defraud and rob Christians of their pious freedom. Maybe if you, it's if about you, the pilgrimages. If you, is that what it's about? Pilgrimage? Requiring Maybe? people Here, to here's, do it. No, here's what he's talking about. Thus it follows, firstly in the above article, that no one is able to bind food to any one time. Like during Lent, you can't eat this. Okay? Or on Friday, you can't eat this. So, and that, that's what he's talking about. Uh, that, that we're not uh, bound by time. It, anyone by saying that one is not allowed to eat food at certain times at all, you ought to let the disciple of Christ that is, the believers say at all times, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath also, of this Sabbath also. And then there's another couplet here between 19 and 20. Christ alone is the mediator between God and us. What is it, 19? 19. And in 20, God supplies everything to us through Christ and in Christ's name. From this it follows that no other intercessor except Christ is needed for us beyond this life. And there he's talking about confessing to the priest. This is not necessary. Mm -hmm. you know, the priesthood of all the people. It's not much to the about that. He and Luther agreed. Right, but the, 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 the point is that, that you made was about the, the church that they established was again a hierarchical church where they, they made the rules. And what's happened then with the American Baptist Church, churches, American Baptist churches, uh, is the congregational church where there is no hierarchical structure. They're a member of the association because the congregation decides to be a member of the, uh, the association, but the association doesn't rule over them. And that very dramatically different form of church government uh, is relatively unique. Oh, it, it goes back to the Anabaptists. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm not saying that, that they, they originated, I'm saying that what we have today is very different than most churches. Most are like the Presbyterians, where the, the central church owns the building. Well, I don't think that's true with the Presbyterians. Presbyterians? Not the, not, the, not the local church. I think it depends on I'm who sorry, provided I'm the money. I'm sorry, I'm trying to read this. I'm not following close enough. Because when those churches left the Presbytery, uh, there was some what, of them. There's what we would refer to as a brouhaha. Mm -hmm. <laughs> who owns it became a big question because who is the Presbytery? He, he's question. talking in 19 about praying to, Saint, to the saints. Should you point to the merit or intercession of the saints which are now with God through whom you intend to come to God, I can say only, no one comes to God but through Christ alone. And, and then in verse 21 he says, but we can ask each other here on earth yeah. to pray. But those, those, <laughs> those conclusions so are, are quite obvious in Scripture. Yeah, he, he starts off with scriptures. I'm just trying, I'm right, just trying to find I mean, what places I mean where, he's, the, where he the, points to what he's upset about. The foundation for the church's position regarding saints and praying to saints mm -hmm. is nowhere in scripture. According to him. Well, show me. I can't. I'm not a Catholic. Well, I know. <laughs> but what I mean is when, when you say according to him, 
the, the point is that, yes, according to him, and according to me, and, and, according to I, me. And, and, and my challenge <laughs> to anyone is to find some dispute with that. I mean, show me the, the disputing evidence. It, it That's what the Roman Catholic well, is. If you take the, no, if you take the word, if you take the phrase that Jesus, uh, that uh, the prayer, the, what is it, the prayers of the righteous availeth much? Yeah. Okay. So, and you take the word righteous the uh, in terms of the saints, and saints meaning those who have died and are now with Christ, then then you can come up with that conclusion that pray to the to the that the righteous in, who are with Christ can make intercession for and us. And you're pulling the well, that's the other thing that's interesting about what he said. He didn't say that it wasn't that that it isn't so. He said it's not necessary. Probably a safer thing to do. Well, <laughs> right. Did that you were saying last time about uh, the Roman Catholic Church had this structure where they said this scripture means this and that scripture means that, but Luther came along and said no. Here's the general structure in which you interpret scripture. You apply to everything. You cannot. The Roman Catholic Church doesn't have the authority to say X means. 25 wine, 30. Allegorically, they can't, they can't say. They can't just make something up. Right, right. Yeah. So when it says the prayer of the righteous, you the scripture is not trying to point you to people who have died. The scripture is trying to point you to people who are living, your fellow believers yeah. joined together and support you in prayer. And That's what scripture is trying to righteous? To. No, not one. <laughs> <laughs> if you read it in context. And, all, and also, and this is probably a discussion for another day, but. Why did people, um, for example, the Roman Catholic Church, place so much? They're praying, mm -hmm. and they're praying to supposedly people in heaven, the saints. Why would you place all the contents? That how, how did that come about in the Roman well, Church? Well, I was just saying, why, oh. why would they place the contents if they're going to pray and do it to, mm -hmm. if they're going to pray, just go to the main person. Why go to the, the second person? My gut feeling is is it, is it safer? Is it closer? Is it no? My my, my gut my different. gut feeling is that we're dealing with pagan religions' influences on Christianity, and the fact that the uh, that the pagan religions had many gods, mm -hmm. it was difficult for converts to Christianity to think in terms of only one. So we start developing a a saint who is the the prayer person for the. The people on ships, and another saint who's the, you know, for the different uh, shopkeepers or whatever. So you replace the little G of ESs with a saint, each one. Mm -hmm. in, in that case, you were you were expecting a logical reason, whereas the reason may be that somebody's replacing one habit with yeah. another habit. Yeah. When I went to when I went to Athens, for example, uh, and and there was the uh, there was the um, uh, church of the uh, of the uh, Virgin Mary. Mm -hmm. uh, it's built on the place where the where the temple of, uh, of Athena used to be, and uh, brides would come there to pray to the Virgin Athena before their weddings. And now brides go there to pray to the Virgin Mary before their weddings. Oh. Old habits die uh, slowly. <laughs> It takes also remember that this was a pretty illiterate society. Less than less than five to fifteen percent of the people were literate. I mean, you're not talking about a society in which everyone could read. I mean, most of them could not read. Luther was a, had been in a monastery. Uh, what was he? An Augustinian, mm -hmm. and it was the observant Augustinians, the strictest of the group. As weekly, all these people learned what they knew about scripture while they were Roman Catholic. I mean, I, that, you know, the, the rest of the folk, there wasn't much learning outside of the church at that time. The, the previous century was the century of the Great Plague. I mean, this comes along in 1530, and the, the Great Plague was 14. Yeah, well, there was 1390 to 1480, and, and there had been, you know, uh, about a third of Europe had been decimated. 
And so that at this time, one of the reasons the German farmers were becoming a little more vigorous was the plague wasn't bothering them and they all had bigger families. And in southern Germany, the farmers wanted, wanted their labor. I mean, in the 30 years, I mean, in the Peasants' War, which followed one of these, about 1530, I think, uh, the, the noblemen, including one of Luther's favorite noblemen, said this forest, which had been open to the public, uh, you could go on in there and hunt, now became, the prince said, that's my territory. So if you want to go hunt there, you got to pay me a fee. Now, the monasteries were doing the same thing. Big monasteries throughout Germany were doing similar things. They were saying, you folks want to fish in this lake? We own the lake. The NRA has been fighting them ever since. <laughs> <laughs> so that, you know, it was a crude, um, rather illiterate society at this time. I mean, it wasn't exactly where, you know, 85% of the people could read and write. And that made them the subjects, then, of those who could. Uh, and, and if the, the change. Has anyone gotten as far as 37 and 38? All Christians ought to obey the public magistrates without exception. But only if they order nothing against God. That's out of the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, uh, but the, the way that, that he, yeah. he's, he's got it listed is you absolutely are going to Without exception. Oh, I see. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then, here's the exception. Here's the exception, yeah. And that's then, that's, you said that was the, um, when this, when the civil law, you had big baptisms and then, because the civil magistrate required this. That's his poor German. Yeah. <laughs> And doesn't he go on to say that all the magistrates are supposed to the life of the magistrates yeah. yes. are to conform to the divine rules? The one power of one's rule is best and most stable when it is from God, and with God, and worst and weakest when it is from one's own desires. This is 43. Yeah, but don't, don't skip 39. Yeah. Don't skip 47. I mean, it all builds up. So, each one of these statements, is there a, is it just a statement or is there a no, explanation they, behind each one? The, I got 39, for example, has uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 pages of explanation. Okay, as with, I think with Luther, That's each, why each one of Whenever you bring one up, I'm quickly trying to find the heart so, of the explanation. So with, with Luther, each one of his theses was backed up with scripture? Yeah, the theses, the theses were issued as a public debate, mm -hmm. and the same thing here with Zwingli's articles. And each one was backed up with but, scripture? But these, these, are the, these are the backups that Zwingli had for them. Okay. But, but he was, as he was inviting people, these were the arguments that he had created mm -hmm. to justify the statement that he had made. But what were the arguments in scripture or just his logical reasoning? No, that's almost always scripture. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But then look at look at the trouble it's made with, uh, what is it, 60, I can't do it, let's see, 40, 48. I wrote a paper on his different techniques of argument. There's about six different forms of argument that he uses, but I don't have my paper with me. But he uses everything from syllogisms to par uh, par uh, parallels to synecdoche, he calls it the part stands for the whole. Um, so there, there are various methods that he uses, but scripture is, scripture is his top method. Uh, well, Luther had 95, he has 67, and the uh, Church of England has 39. 39. <laughs> I know. It's, it, it, take, it, takes, it's, it gets easier and easier to disobey the Pope. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but I don't even need a reason. <laughs> the couplets that I'm, I'm mm -hmm. quoting is two. I mean, he got two out of them, but really, you, you can't have you say no exceptions. And, and then give an exception. exception is a separate thing, then. I mean, 
That's just to stress that's, even that, more. That way, that way you got a higher count. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Not all of them. Enjoy these, but let me give you one last handout because our time is flying here. And this is uh, so. So if you're if you're going if you're not happy with the mass, what are you going to replace it with? Sunday whitewashing. <laughs> Action. It should be for use of the Lord's Supper, a memorial or thanksgiving, not a sacrifice, not a mass, a memorial or thanksgiving of Christ as it will be begun in Zurich at Easter in the year 1525. Do this in remembrance of me. So, mm -hmm. Do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me is what yeah, ah. the scripture was. Right? Mm -hmm. That's where we come from. So we're remembering him in the memorial So you said the first time was on the Easter of that year? The Easter, the Easter service that year, 1525. Uh, he puts this into uh, practice. And I just want to point out to you that it starts with the pastoral prayer. There's no singing. Right, well, that uh, he talks against singing or bellowing yes. is oh, done no, okay. in praise of men. That's right. Okay. And, and, um, and, and, it, and it, is, it is not a pastor and deacon dialogue that like, goes on in the uh, Orthodox Church. Uh, and I guess it must in the Catholic, but I don't know that order because it goes off enough. But instead, instead, it's the men of the congregation and the women of the congregation, back and forth. So they have this unison prayer. Um, praise be to God, everybody says. The pastor says, glory to God on high. And the men say, and peace on earth. And the women say, to persons a right will. The men, we praise thee, we bless thee. The women, we worship thee, we glorify thee. Why don't we just do that? Why don't we just do that? So I'll play, I'll play the pastor, and uh, Roki, you be the reader, and uh, Joe, you want to be the leader? Uh, you, you show up on the second page. It's totally. I couldn't find the leader. Yeah. So I'll, I'll do the pastor. O oh, Almighty Eternal God, whom all creatures rightly honor, worship and praise as their Lord, Creator and Father. Grant us, poor sinners, that with real constancy of faith and faith we may perform thy praise and thanksgiving, which thine only begotten Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, hath commanded the faithful to do in memory of his death. Through the same Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in unity with the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. The reading is found in the first epistle of Paul to the Corinthians. The 11th chapter, verses 20 through uh, 29. Are you supposed to quote it? Yeah, I do. That's why. Okay. You, you have to read it. Oh, you have okay. to read it. Right? Yeah. Yes. Ephesians. No. Corinthians 11. And where it says unison, Joe, my guess is you should you should lead that. Okay. We don't do that. Is he yeah. Yeah. But somebody needs to start it so the rest of us. Oh, praise, praise be to God. Yeah. But let's let Rory read. 20, 20 through 29. 11, 20 to 29. When you come together, it is not the Lord's step for you to eat. For as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this, whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner 
will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord, eats and drinks judgment on himself. Of course, Luther would say, Dear Mr. Swingley, yeah. didn't, didn't Paul just say yeah. <laughs> that it's the body and blood of the Lord? Okay, so unison, Joe. Praise, Praise, Praise be, be to God. God. Glory be to God on high. And, and peace, peace on earth. To persons of the right will. We praise thee, we, we bless thee. We worship thee, we glorify thee. We give thanks to thee for thy great glory and goodness, O Lord God, heavenly King, Father Almighty. O Lord, thou only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost. O Lord, thou Lamb of God, Son of the Father, thou that takest away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. Thou that takest away the sin of the world, receive our prayer. Thou that sittest at the right hand of the Father, have mercy upon us. For Thou only art the Lord. Thou only art the Lord. Thou only, O Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, art the most high in the glory of God. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. spirit. And it's me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this should be the reader. The reader. Yeah. And Joe's the leader. I'm the reader. You're the leader. Oh, I'm the reader. Reader. the reader. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the following reading from the Gospel is found in John, the sixth chapter, verses 48 through 63. Maybe someone else can read this. That's his. It's ones that you were. John's. After what you were reading earlier. I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate the man in the desert, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for you the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna and died but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching, who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? What if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken, to you are spirit, and they are life. Amen. Then you're supposed to say praise and thanks be to God. Praise and thanks be to God. He willeth to forgive all our sins according to his holy word. Amen. Amen. Uh, reader begins with the first one. I believe in one God. In the Father Almighty. And in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son. Who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. And sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. 
For men he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost. The Holy Universal Christian Church. The communion of saints. The forgiveness of sins. The resurrection of the body. And the life everlasting. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters, in keeping with the observance and the institution of our Lord Jesus Christ, we now desire to eat the bread and drink the cup, which he has commanded us to use in commemoration, praise and thanksgiving that he suffered death for us and shed his blood to wash away our sin. Wherefore, let everyone call to mind, according to Paul's word, how much comfort, faith, and assurance he has in the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Lest anyone pretend to be a believer who is not, who is not and in so be guilty of our Lord's death. Neither let anyone commit offense against the whole Christian communion, which is the body of Christ. Let us pray together the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer. I think we're supposed to pray the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> <laughs> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. O Lord God Almighty, who by the Spirit has brought forth us together into thy one body, in the unity of faith, and has commanded that body to give thee praise and thanks for thy goodness and free gift in delivering thine only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to death for our sins, grant that we may do the same so faithfully that we may not, by any pretense or deceit, Provoke thee who art the truth which cannot be deceived. Grant also that we may live as purely as becometh thy body, thy family and thy children, so that even the unbelieving may learn to recognize thy name and glory. Keep us, Lord, that thy name and glory may never be reviled because of our lives. O Lord, ever increase our faith, which is trust in thee, Thou who livest and reignest, God forever and ever. Amen. And then you have the uh, uh, the text again that was from that was from the reading of uh, of uh, First Corinthians 11. But then in parentheses, notice how how they did it. The designated servers carry around the unleavened bread, from which each one of the faithful takes a morsel or mouthful with his own hands. They don't, they're not coming up. They're taking the bread around. Has it offered to him by the server who carries the bread around? And when those with the bread have proceeded so far that everyone has eaten his small piece, I was wrong, they don't eat it together. Right. Yeah. Um, has eaten his small piece. The other servers then follow with the cup and in the same manner give it to each person to drink. It makes sense because it's a common cup. Mm -hmm. You couldn't wait till everybody served. And all of this takes place in such honor and propriety as well becomes the Church of God and the Supper of Christ. Afterwards, the people having eaten and drunk, thanks is given according to the example of Christ by the use of Psalm 112, and the shepherd or pastor begins, Praise, O ye servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun unto the going down of the day, the Lord's name is highly praised. The Lord is exalted above all nations, and his glory above the heavens. Who is like unto the Lord our God, who is sitting so high and bending down to the hair of the in heaven and earth? He raises up the humble out of the dust and lifteth the poor out of the filth. That he may set him with princes, with the princes of his people. He maketh the barren woman of the house to be a mother who has the joy of children. We give thee thanks, O Lord, for all thy gifts and blessings, thou who livest and reignest, 
God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Depart in peace. Uh, notice that we give thanks, O Lord, for all thy gifts and blessings. Okay? Now this this comes from the idea in the Catholic Church that the that the uh, uh, bread and, and wine are the gifts of right. Christ that are being offered to us. Uh, Calvin will take this on non-communion Sundays and incorporate the offering as the giving of our gifts. Okay. So we bring our gifts just like they brought the gifts of the bread and wine uh, uh, to the priest. We now give our gifts uh, as uh, the offering. So he, so he still on non-communion non Sundays. Still sees that the bread and wine as gifts, mm -hmm. even though it's non-sacrament. Right. Oh. Okay. You know, one of the problems I have with, with this dispute that was going on between Finley and, and uh, Luther and the other reformers is I think it stretches the use of language. If you're going to start talking about something divine and about God, you really can't capture it in words. Yeah, you should. And they're getting pretty close to that yeah, I guess they over the dispute. You know, when he says, this is my body, those words uh, capture more than the words normally care. And, and, and I think that's what caused a lot of these disputes. They tried to limit the words in some way to its specific meaning at that time, but if you look how the word is being used, it's de it's describing something divine. <laughs> I mean, isn't it? And then the uh, the, the, the creedal yeah. statement. Uh, and and that so, can, can a word really describe completely something that's mm -hmm. divine? And so, but, you know, I tend to be with, I tend to be with Luther on this that although he doesn't say it's a sacrifice. He, he says Christ is present. Right. But, I mean, he drops it there. He doesn't go beyond that. I mean, he just said he's present. He, well, he says with wood bread and wine. And that's where we get the word consubstantiation. And he takes the act of taking the bread and wine to, have, to impart some grace or not? No. Um, because because that gives you power over the grace of God, so it is only it is only the only act of imparting grace comes from Christ. But something does take place when you there's some um, you're, you're but you're receiving, receiving you're receiving. So if you were not to do that, you would lose out on something. Um, so it's it's yeah. very gasping in its arch and its yeah, and it's, weight. It's if you do not go there, I mean, I suppose the Catholic people on TV say this. Uh, the other church can find the actual sick, but they're not taking the full measure of grace which has been right. given to the church. And so you're missing out. You have two of the seven, let's say, sacraments. You miss out on all the extra good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, at least Zwingli will say if we if we don't use uh, if we don't use the Lord's Supper but we use baptism mm -hmm. as an example, uh, Zwingli says um, that um, that the um, uh, those who say that the child who dies before baptism uh, goes to hell or some other place uh, is not true because the the child of a Christian family has been born into the Christian family, and so, and so, uh, therefore, the, the intention of the, of the family, uh, the, and the faith of the family, um, cr create, it, it's kind of a, kind of a shelter, I'm not sure the word he uses, but it's kind of the safety. And God's of, grace covers. And God's grace covers that. And, and for the heathen who has never heard of Christ, mm -hmm. but acts in a godly way, okay, uh, the intention of his action has created this sort of atmosphere as well, 
Um, he, he, won't, he won't say the man has has, has merited. Uh, but but he but created God. No, 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 no. But but his actions <laughs> created something. Whereas with other stuff, he's already said your actions. Your actions does not create anything. Well, yeah. except God the problem with that is, in, like, I think well, Joe's mentioned, and it's exactly what Joe was he's saying. Trying to now find he's every now thing he's struggling, and and Zwingli says, if the scripture doesn't say it, you should not try to fix the scripture and say things and speculate about things that the scripture doesn't answer. Mm -hmm. And so he says that, but then but he goes right on and speculates <laughs> what, what happens to it because he's, he's bent on defining this God to the last detail, which he can't do. It's going right. But it's like what you said about the Roman Catholic Church. People had... People were asking so many questions about what happened when Jesus was young, what happened yeah. with Mary after Jesus. Sure. So they came up with all these places and um, supposed stories and events about... When did children start saying why? <coughs> what age? I can't remember. But anyway, so why, why is a big book? Hmm? Right after they learned the word mind. Well, why can't I eat that tree there? So we make up, so I mean, we make, make these things up that, I think there's one gospel which says, you know, what Jesus did when he was young, the, um, he uh, turned something. Oh, birds. Uh, cl uh, turned a friend. Play birds and robbers. real birds. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And so, okay. all kinds of things. so that people will stop. Kids and the goats. Yeah. That refuse to play with them. Yeah. So I mean, and for now, these guys, just, they, have some, they have so much time that they can write on every single issue yeah. defined to the last detail. Yeah. But that's, I mean, that's the scholasticism of the Middle Ages. It becomes very yeah. speculative. How many angels can sit on the head of a pen? You know, that kind of thing. And Well, it, it, they were taking things seriously. They were taking things they seriously. They wanted to find out what this really means. Yeah. It, was a, it was a reverence thing. It wasn't yeah, really... It was, no, it wasn't, it wasn't shallow in, right. by any means. But but it had flaws in it um, where it could, where it was subject to misuse and and that's and that's what starts going on with the sale of indulgences now that we've got a printing press and we can publish these papers enough uh, to to really make some money on it let's, let's yeah. advertise big that was like the internet of today. Okay, our time has come to a halt. Uh, there's uh, still food here if somebody would like to have some. Um, that's fine with me. And but let's give thanks. And <clears throat> Lord God, we do thank you for this time together. Thank you for the um, efforts that these folks of antiquity put in um, trying to understand and, and to lead the church. We pray that in our day uh, we have learned something from them. Uh, and our respect for them is, is clear. On the other hand, we would uh, ask your guidance that we not fall into the same traps, but indeed, uh, we lead according to your will. Give us your blessing, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Next week, John Calvin. I'm not sure what food we should have, but... Um, it's, the well, but it's, already, uh, it's already been determined. <laughs> so as soon as I think of it, as soon as I think of it, it's only it's only me uh, fulfilling that. Fulfilling